good evening everyone thank you so much for joining us today for those of you who are wondering what first principles is it's a product webinar series run by gojek to host product experts like khania to share their ideas mistakes and learnings with us uh, we have a group on meetup as well and i'll share the link to it in the chat please feel free to join the community uh, we are super excited to host khania who has a lot of interesting lessons to share with us today uh, thank you so much for taking out the time khania uh, yeah khania thank you for having me yush thank you khania has worked with a uh, on a wide range of products at google from maps to chrome os to payments and i let her give the intro to do complete justice to it so over to you khania thanks so much ayush uh, for the introduction and thanks for everyone uh, for joining the session i hope it'll be informative for you so i'm just going to share my screen and start the presentation So a quick intro on myself uh, as Ayush mentioned I worked on a few different teams at Google I've been at Google for about 4 years before that I studied computer science and psychology at Yale University which is actually quite a good combination if you're interested in product management because you have to know computer science you have to know coding but you also have to know how to work with people um and work with people of many different levels and so even the psychology part came in handy um so So I started off at on the Chrome OS team so working on Chromebooks Google's laptops uh focusing on hardware I started off in San Francisco and as a fresh college graduate I had studied computer science but I actually knew nothing about hardware and even less about operating systems and so it was a really great you know learning by drinking uh, from the fire hose uh, environment kind of sink or swim so i was thrown into this environment and i remember in the first few weeks i had no idea what people were talking about when they were talking about chrome os um and you know uh and and then slowly over time i started reading a bunch more i started talking to the engineers and picking it up and after a few months i the way i was i would speak a sentence and i knew that that sentence wouldn't even have made sense to me a few months ago so it's kind of crazy how fast the learning curve is at google um and i'm actually really grateful because i think a lot of people go into product management because maybe they're not that technical or you know they're they're a bit scared of like back end or infrastructure type work and because i was thrown into this i learned kind of a whole different way of product management and pming which i hope to share with you all um and how when when you're working on chrome os when you're working on a laptop you have to think in terms of an ecosystem it's not just one user with one product that it might be with an app uh but you have to think about you know what is the price of the the laptop so for example most chromebooks were kind of getting cheaper and cheaper uh and it was a race to the bottom of um like you know laptops that were going $200 $150 and so margins were super thin and it was really hard for people to make a profit and so google themselves launched a $1000 chromebook which was my, one of my first projects working on the pixel book uh i worked on that pixel book and um we basically made this decision because once you have a $1000 laptop it raises the whole brand of chrome os and it makes the $400 $500 laptops look more feasible uh rather than if you had a $500 laptop and a bunch of $200 laptops and so I, it was interesting lessons like that that i learned um i also because i learned so much about hardware i worked on um the stylus solution for the pixel book and we were actually able to get a patent for the fastest stylus solution in the market when we launched which is back in 2017 so it was a very exciting time uh, and very exciting first team at google um I joined as part of the Google Associate Product Management program and so with part of, as part of that program you spend one year on one team which was Chrome OS was my first team and then you have to rotate you have to pick another team for your second year and this way people get exposed to many different parts of Google and they learn uh, different ways of product management I didn't just change teams I also changed countries so I wanted a new challenge so I moved out of the US and moved to Europe I I I worked on the Google Maps team in Switzerland and there again i wanted uh, to learn something completely new so i i joined the data analysis team of google maps so our team was responsible for all of the data that google maps was collecting i learned a lot about logging um and how to you know build accurate logs and data pipelines and then also how to show that data to the to the decision makers in a way that was easily digestible because we had so much data it was really hard to parse uh so that was my second team was in switzerland uh that was a really great year there i learned a lot and it was also a very different work life culture um i think europeans value work life balance more than americans do 
Uh, and then the, my current team, so a, a year after Switzerland, I joined the Google Pay and Next Billion Users team in Singapore. Uh, the, it, basically, that, that move was motivated by a few things. I really enjoyed Europe, and, but I wanted to work in emerging markets. I'm originally from Pakistan. And so I wanted to th think about how tech actually moves the needle in an emerging market and how actually in emerging markets you have the potential to go from zero to one. And so that's what you know built my interest in the Next Billion Users team, which is mostly focusing on the next billion people who are coming online. How do we build products for them? And the, one of the products that they had launched was Google Pay in India. Uh, and it's, I, I'm sure for those of you who are based in India, you must have seen or used the app. Uh, so my job, because I'm Pakistani, it was very hard for me to work in India. So my job was to figure out what is the next country that we should launch Google Pay in. And so I kind of jumped into that. And then I realized that you know the app is just one level. I, again, took my learnings from the last two teams and realized that a lot of it was the most important part was the infrastructure. So India's UPI payment system infrastructure uh, was really key to Google Pay success in India. So I started uh, talking to other countries and see, understanding which other countries are building this kind of infrastructure. I was able to go meet with like the central bank and finance ministers of countries like Brazil, Mexico, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, even Pakistan, and kind of explain to them why this infrastructure is really good for financial inclusion. And then we were uh, we built we wrote a white paper on how exactly to build this payments infrastructure, uh, and we co-published it with the World Bank. So that's kind of my product journey. So not really like a typical journey. And uh, while I was at Google Pay in Singapore, I did also launch the Google Pay app uh, for Singapore. So that's like my first like actual app launch. And before that, I didn't. I, I just worked on you know like I mentioned a laptop. I worked on data analysis. And I worked on like you know this infrastructure payment system infrastructure. So it was a very uh, interesting journey of product management, and I hope to share with you all of the different angles that I've learned through this. So as most of you on the call are product managers, you know that a PM is basically someone who sits between these three uh, areas. So you have the engineering side, obviously, which you know you can't build a product without engineering. You have the design of the product, and then you also have the business aspect. You know, what is the business case? Why should we build this? Why do customers care? The way I think about PMing is that uh, we have a few responsibilities. We, as PMs, have, need to help our teams deliver the right products to their users. Uh, and that, that could be an end user, or that could be a developer in case you're building a developer tool. Um, and then also, you need to really deeply understand the technical uh, domain. I think it's in Google, there's a really strong culture where PMs have to be technical. When they take in associate product managers, they make sure that we have a computer science degree because we need to actually understand the tech to be able to work with engineers um, and also just have them respect you. Because Google is such an engineering driven company, uh, you need that you, they will only respect you if you know what you're talking about. And it, the, it, it's interesting because the part of the reason this associate product manager program started at Google was. Um, Basically, uh, when Google was in just a three, four-year-old company and Marissa Mayer was there, uh, they kept hiring all of these MBAs, pe people with MBAs as product managers. But those people were speaking business speak, and then engineers were speaking engineer speak, and they were, did not get along. <laughs> and they did not, were not able to communicate. And so actually, Marissa Mayer start, started this program where she said, let's take uh, computer science graduates and train them in the Google way of product managing. Um, and so when we come in, we are, we're not speaking business speak. We're mostly speaking engineering speak, and we pick up the business stuff along the way. Um, and also, so like I mentioned in the previous slide, you're working at the intersection of engineering, UX design, marketing, legal, and business development. So that just means that your day is never boring. You are always jumping and constantly con context switching between different projects, but also between different hats. So in the engineering meeting, maybe you have to represent the business development point of view. But at the business development meeting, you have to represent the engineering point of view. Um, as a PM, you always, you're the main advocate for the user. Everyone else, obviously, they all really care about the user, but you know they have other priorities. Engineers often want to build the most interesting thing or the most complicated thing. UX cares mo most about like you know looking how how it looks. BD cares about making money. Uh, marketing cares about making the brand look good. Legal cares about covering your uh, your backsides. But you, as the PM, have to care about 
what the user the most and like will what will, will the user like it will they will it solve a problem for them um, fifth you have to relentlessly prioritize because as a PM there's always so many competing things that you could be doing and so uh, you, you need for all of your projects you need to decide okay what do we build next how do we make sure our resources which is mostly our engineering team how are they used effectively how do we make sure we don't waste their time when things are ambiguous how do you make sure that the engineers are you know uh, building the right thing uh, and then you know to in order to prioritize you need data you need to add, be able to analyze data at Google scale and so a lot of PMs that I've seen be successful at a place like Google are people who can really understand um, use data and use insights to understand their own users better and make the right decisions for their product and for their users. And the best slash worst part of all of this is that you have all of these responsibilities as a PM, but you don't have any authority. You're not, there's no one reporting to you. You're just working horizontally across all of these different domains. And so you also have to make sure that people are like, you know, people respect you, people respect your decisions that you can get stuff done without having any formal authority over anyone. So one way that we think through how exactly to design products is to go through this loop. So again, as you're the PM, think of the customers or think of the user first, you know, and the more you can empathize or put yourself in the shoes of the customer, some of the best PMs I know are the people who actually are such a big fans, super fans of their own product. Uh, so, you know, be in the shoes of the customer, then think about the, that customer's needs. Um, what are their pain points? What are they still struggling with? What are things that could be better? Uh, what is a problem that's only partially solved? And then think through, how can I answer those needs? How can I solve those problems? You can solve it within the product or out, outside the product. Some of these things can be solved through marketing and awareness, uh, but some of these need to be built into features. So then you actually build and launch the feature but then that's not it. Like you might have thought something is a pain point, and then once you launch the feature, it's not that successful. So you need to also measure the success of every feature that you launch. You could have a hypothesis that there is a pain point, um, and then when you actually launch, no one uses your feature. So then uh, when you measure when you measure the results, you realize that that actually wasn't correct. Uh, another way I like to think about PMing is that there's different cycles uh, in the in the product development life cycle, basically. Uh, so your the first step is uh, definition. So in, that's actually my most favorite step, or the most exciting part, uh, is when you know it's kind of a green field. You have a new project, uh, and then um, you're kind of defining that project and trying to figure out what what to do. So for example, let's say like you realize there's a pain point and you want to you want to define it so you're most of the time you're a visionary you're kind of you know you have a, a grand vision that you want to achieve and you're going out as a spokesperson and getting people bought in and getting people excited about it and also trying to understand what resources are needed like how many engineers would we need how much legal or marketing or other support would we need uh, but most of mostly you're trying to convey this vision that you have and trying to actually formulate the vision first for yourself and then to other stakeholders. So that's the product definition. The second step is actual development. So in it, most of the time, you're project managing and resource managing. You're making sure that we have the right engineers, that they're being utilized to the max, that we're parallelizing as much work as we can, and also mostly you're project managing, which is my least favorite part, part of PMing, but it's very necessary, being detail-oriented um, and, and making sure that nothing slips through the cracks because you're the owner of this project and, and product and so you need to make sure that everything is in order so you need to go above and beyond make sure all the legal and marketing side is covered make sure that all the uh, features and the last mile um, the last mile pieces are also covered and then when it's launch time again you have to be a spokesperson you need to go in with marketing you need to make sure that upper management and leadership is aligned and then you need to make sure that marketing is out there uh, pushing for uh, everything. And then you're a lot more a coordinator at this step because you're working with now all of the cross-functional teams to make sure that we can get to launch. Um, once something is launched, then you're a bit more of a business analyst. Now you're looking at the data coming in, understanding how users are using your, your feature. And as you think of pain points, you go back into step one of definition and uh, finding out issues or finding out the new features that you can build. 
Uh, honey, just one quick thing. The bottom part uh, in the last slide, we couldn't see the x-axis. I think if you just zoom out a bit on the screen. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep. Yep. You can see it now. Okay. Perfect. So the first, the first stage was definition. The second stage was development. The third stage was launch. And the fourth stage is maintenance. Okay. Thank you. So as a PM, the, the biggest weapon that you have in your armory is the product requirements document. This is uh, really big at Google, so we always use this document to actually define what are we going to build. Um, and it contains really, uh, basically, the structure is usually uh, like this, where the first step is the vision. You know, why, the why. Like, why are we doing what we're doing? Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen that Simon Sinek starts with why. That's like when someone looks at the document, they need to understand the motivation behind what you're doing. And then focus on the users. Who are the people who are going to be using your product or your feature? And then what are the use cases? Like what are they actually doing? And what, what is the scope of this uh, product requirement document? And then the design, how will it work? What are the user flows? What are the features? And so that kind of is the scope of the PRD. And then you go into the future roadmap, like saying, this is just the first step. But after this, we can do all of these things. And then obviously, what are the metrics that you're going to measure? And it's really important for you to think of the metrics at this early stage, because you want to know what success means for you and define that success early. Um, and so all of this uh, information is fueled through market analysis, whatever tech we're using, and what users we're focusing on. So I'm going to go through a few scenarios. So let's say you spent weeks building the perfect PRD and that has every single edge case fully fleshed out and is 100% comprehensive. You send it out for review, and no one looks at it. Uh, I think if this was a normal session, I would ask how many of you have gone through this. I know I've gone through this multiple times. In fact, when we start off at Google, they tell us no one is going to read your doc. So what do you do then? So there's a few ways that we approach uh, writing PRDs. The first is like in a known environment. If you've built a similar feature in the past and what you're doing is just incremental, then you don't actually need to spend hours writing a whole new PRD um, and just copy pasting from your old document. All you need to do is just create an amendment to the existing PRD. Then you find a peer reviewer or someone else that also thinks, hey, what, what you're saying is a good idea. We should actually do this. And make sure you bounce off. Because uh, I, and this is something that Google really encourages, is to be really collaborative in whenever, especially in the brainstorming phase. Because in the early stages, no decisions have been made. And so you, know, you are coming in with a certain perspective. But you know, other people might have other perspectives that you didn't consider. And so in that, in that early stage, make sure you're bouncing ideas off of people and especially a trusted person who knows the product well, but maybe coming from a different perspective than you. After that, uh, after you've gotten someone else's vetting and they also think it's a good idea, then talk to your engineers and UX team as well as your leads to make sure that they're supportive of the idea. So right now, you've, all you've done is add in an addendum to the PRD, and now you're going to get the approval that you need to launch it. And then af only after that do you start planning with the cross-functional teams, prioritizing, understanding the backlog of you know, how does this sit compared to other work that you need to do, what is the exact MVP, which you'll spec out in the PRD, uh, and then also what are the potential roadblocks and how do you make sure that you can deal with them up front. And then you start your project. Now, what if? the idea that you're thinking about is not an incremental feature, but it's a new idea. So let's say you come up with a new idea. So what Google actually does is usually we have a planning for certain uh, times. So we have quarterly planning every Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And then we also have yearly planning. And in yearly planning, we plan, OK, these are all the things that we're going to build next year. And obviously, things keep changing, and there are priorities, priorities uh, that uh, evolve. However, we usually try to have a plan and also allocate resources based on that plan. Now, let's say if you come up with a new idea in the middle of the year, what, what do you do? Because 
you know, there's always new information and new data coming in and, and new market analysis or, you know, understanding what competitors are doing and realizing that, hey, I might want to do something different or I think this is a feature we didn't think about that would bring in a lot of usage and growth. So first of all, like I mentioned earlier, talk to people. Make sure it's not just some assumptions that you're making. Talk to people in the hallway and MK, that's our micro kitchen <laughs> um, where we get snacks. And make sure that other people also think it's a good idea and it's not just you. Then, and this is key, is create a one pager. I can't tell you the amount of, the number of one pages that I've written throughout my career. And the thing is a one pager is just super exciting because you can write out an idea that you have, but you're not committing to anything and you're only writing one page. So you're not, you know, fleshing out everything or spending hours or days on it, but you, you think it's a good idea and it's something uh, that, sh that can be done without fully committing to it just yet. So like I mentioned, I've written countless one pages. Most of them have failed or most of them did not get past that one page around. And so what you should do early on is like share that one pager with a trusted circle. So you have PMs, UX engineers, people that are excited about your product uh, and, and, and get feedback on it. Sometimes the feedback might be, actually, we don't think this is a good idea. Other times the feedback would be, how about thinking about it from this angle or putting this spin on it? And then you can iterate on that one pager and keep improving on it as you learn more from more people and more perspectives. And then once you've gotten the, sometimes you get the one pager into a state where you think, okay, other people also think that this is a good idea and hey, I think we should do this. And so um, in those exciting times, then your, your process is very similar to earlier where you talk to your engineers and UX elite and to ensure that they are supportive of your idea. And then you start your PRD based on the one pager. And so this is what's really key because first you're getting a buy-in on the idea itself. And you know, one page is there's so many questions, so many open things, so many edge cases maybe you haven't thought through, but they think the idea is directionally accurate. And so when you're writing your PRD, again, the same principles that you use for your one pager is useful. Be concise. Again, no one has time to read your document. The amount of times that I've written a document and then I've had to schedule meetings with someone to actually explain it to them or even write a deck about it because you know it's way easier to flip through a deck. You do all of this because when you're in the spokesperson phase or the visionary phase, you want to get buy-in for your idea. No one else owes you any time or anything. And so the ease, if you make it really easier for that the other person to digest, then the more likely that they will agree with your idea and support your idea. And also, if they understand your idea really well, then they can, uh, uh, like, if it's a, your manager, for example, then your manager can sell it further and sell it to their manager and make sure that you get the resources that you need to build your product. Um, and so another way to make it easy to parse and easy to digest is make it really visual. Include sketches, include mocks, include prototypes, or you know, even make a slide deck. Um, and this is again, as a PM, you're wearing multiple hats. And so I, um, I had to basically learn Sketch and learn Figma and make my own mocks, even though I have a UX team and they're super happy to help. But because they're always working on like the next priority launch thing, you can make their life easier by you know building on mocks or even just building out sketches so that people, at least in your PRD, understand, um, even though that might not be what the final product looks like. And also at Google, we have PRD templates. So the, the requirements of a PRD vary between different teams. Like when we were on Chrome OS, the PRD template was very different because we were optimizing for different things compared to Google Pay, compared to Google Maps. Uh, and so those PRD templates are really helpful to make sure that you're addressing everything that that team needs. Um, and then also make sure you co-author this PRD with your TL and UX designer. And try to keep it short. The shorter, the better. Um, I don't think, I think I've only written one or two PRDs that are over 10 pages, but yeah, anyone who reads that many pages has too much time on their hands and no one <laughs> at Google has that much time on their hands. I think the ideal state for the PRD to be in is a draft that contains most of the ideas but doesn't contain the whole long list of edge cases. And so that draft allows people to uh, comment and pile on. Uh, and, and this is also why we write all of our PRDs in Google Docs because we want the ability for people to collaborate, add on, and do everything in real time as well. 
And then we have something called a program review. Program reviews happen every two weeks, and they're usually focused on a product. So for example, when I was on the Google Pay team, we had a program review for Google Pay Singapore and Google Pay India every two weeks. And so because they were two different products with different priorities, uh, we, the leads would get together and make sure that those products were going on track. Um, and so you, so you make sure, you, when you, go, you, you have to ask for a slot in the program review and make sure that senior leadership is supportive of your idea. Uh, and that now that the PRD is a bit more fleshed out, that they're directionally okay with how you've taken it from the one pager to that PRD. So the third uh, time that you might need to write a PRD is in case there are any unforeseen issues. So in, this is when you've started a project and you find out new information that's not covered on the PRD. So one thing, as soon as you find out that there's an issue, you shouldn't wait until a weekly meeting or until a leadership meeting. You need to discuss it ASAP, because anything that can affect the timeline of a project is uh, really key, and you need to make sure that you're addressing it early on. And then after the stand-up, maybe what I usually do is I just grab a few people and try to brainstorm, OK, what, what are options? What can we do going forward? Uh, so, for example, when we were working on Google Pay Singapore, uh, we had done all of this integration with one of the banks, and then uh, the banks told us, oh, that, that same bank told us that uh, actually they wanted us to use a whole different set of APIs, and it, that would mean integrating and starting all over again. So I had to write out the options as, okay, we can continue with the existing set of APIs, however, there are these issues or like these pros and cons. We can have the new set of APIs. Go, I went to the engineers, I got an estimate of how much time or like basically time lapse do we think it would take, uh, how much added timeline it would take, but also what are the pros. Um, and then basically you once you write that out, the decision is often really obvious to you and it will probably be really obvious to any senior leadership. Uh, but you need to make sure that you write out your reasoning um, so that pe people can make those tough decisions. And also you might have a perspective, uh, but senior leadership might have other priorities. For example, it might be a priority for them to launch as soon as possible, and so they don't care about the added latency that we will have at launch. And so once you have that, once you brainstorm out all the pros and cons, you write that into a one pager, you have to have a path forward for UX and en an engineer. So you say, okay, we're going to go forward with this, this choice. Um, but in the meantime, you're still letting, uh, you're still get iterating on the document. And then once your whole team is unblocked, then any leadership agrees with your direction, then you can update the PRD based on that one pager. So make sure that, and, and this is really hard because PRDs are living documents and it's, re it's really annoying to keep them updated because you have a million other priorities, but anyone else who's looking at your product and wants to know what's happening needs to know the latest. And so make sure you add in all the new information and update all the sections, especially the analytics sections if you're doing a new feature. Send an email to the team. Always, always over communicate these things because you might think in your little circle, in your immediate team that you know what's going on. And it's very annoying to just you know, send emails or write up updates or you know, summarize meetings. But it, the more people are aware, the less churn we have. And especially when you're working with such a large team, um, and especially a cross-functional team with legal and marketing and BD included, you need to make sure that everyone um, everyone is updated because it could be that you know if you don't update people two three weeks later, you marketing comes back and has you know made all of the decks with the with the wrong mocks. So you need to uh, keep them updated. Now let's talk about shipping versus landing. So shipping is another way that we at Google say launching features um, and. At Google, we had we had this culture where we were focused on the launch, and the launch is the exciting part. You know, it's like the you know you usually have a big event. It's like a milestone. Everyone's really excited that the product is finally out the door. But launching is not enough. It's you also need to land. So, what does landing actually mean? Landing is um, landing is basically uh, ensuring that ensuring that the product is successful. So, a launch is hey, the rocket has launched and gone into outer space, awesome. But a landing is, hey, the rocket has actually landed on the moon. If your rocket goes into outer space and then explodes, then that wasn't a successful feature, um, and that wasn't a successful product. And landing is an art. So 
uh, will you be proud of telling your mom this product? So if, for example, something is out the door, but it doesn't really work exactly like you want it, or there's so many things that you need to improve, then it's not finished. You still need to wait for landing. Um, and also, and how do you do that? You need to keep using your product. So dog fooding is an internal term that we use at Google, which is kind of came from a joke. So basically, when you buy dog food and, and the dog food says, new and improved taste, how do we know it's a new and improved taste? It's because the people, or is it the people at the, at the dog food uh, uh, company who are eating their own dog food? And so similar at Google, we need to eat our own dog food. So if I'm working on a product, be it Google Pay or Google Maps or Chrome OS, I need to be using it constantly and finding errors and issues. Um, when I was working on Chrome OS and we were, we were launching the Pixel Book, uh, I was constantly monitoring the, um, I was dog finding, so I was using the Pixel Book even though it was really early on and it was constantly crashing, just so I could keep sending reports of those errors to the engineers. And also, we had this email list of people who were dog fooding our uh, the the Pixelbook laptop, and so I would read every single email that came through and every single issue, and I would file bugs against those issues. And if and if the same issue came up multiple times, I would write down like, okay, uh, this this email ID experienced this issue, this email ID experienced this issue, um, and so you need to be super super in the weeds and detail oriented, uh, which is why every detail matters. And then also make sure that you deliver what you set up to do. Uh, often you write a PRD and you're super excited about all the things that you can do, but then because of timelines dragging on and resource constraints, you launch with an MVP and even that MVP is often scoped down. But you need to, you're only done as a PM when you've delivered that full extent of everything that you said you would do, not just that first iteration of the MVP. And then make sure you're constantly collecting feedback, experimenting uh, and iterating. And also, aesthetics really matter. So uh, this is something that I learned maybe later on in my career. But um, how how something looks. So often, uh, when you're launching something, you're just like, it's OK. If it's like simple, let's just get out the door. It gets the job done. But spending time with UX and making sure UX has the time to run their sprints and deliver things in a way that's really easy to parse for the end user makes a huge difference in how professional your product looks. Now let's talk about execution, which is the majority of a job of a product manager, and especially for junior product managers like myself. So like I told you, the most exciting part of a PM, of being a PM for me is the vision. Um, However, without ex execution, it's just a hallucination. So there's two different models. I'm sure you guys have heard about this where you can design. So one is like you can have all of the details up front, which is a waterfall software development model. Uh, but then on the other model is Scrum and Agile, where you kind of have a grand vision, and then you kind of break down into bite-sized scopes. OK, the first two weeks, we'll work on this. Then the next two weeks, we'll work on this. And then you can uh, keep uh, changing and adding things as they go along. So projects that need to be done linearly uh, and you can't go back to a prior phase need a waterfall mo model. So hardware working on laptops, that was a waterfall model. However, Scrum is when you're launching something with a lot of unknowns. So when we were working on Google Pay in Singapore, you needed, we basically, after launch, we kept having uh, every two weeks um, my, uh, basically milestones to make sure that, you know, as things were, as we were getting feedback from the end users and learning more about, you know, how people are using the app, we can keep building new uh, features or understanding or tweaking our ideas and our understanding of how our product and our feature needs to be worked. And the goal is to be, uh, is to unblock engineers and move really fast. So you, uh, as a PM, need to make sure that your engineering team is not blocked at any time. So UX needs to do their thing. They need to spend a lot of time working on aesthetics and making sure that things are, you know, things are pixel perfect. But engineers don't can't wait for that to start coding. And so the amount of times that I've made mocks on Figma or Sketch or even on Google Slides just to unblock engineers. So I make a mock. I make sure UX agrees. I know that UX will fill in the details later, but I give that mock to engineers so that they can at least start their work. So in conclusion, 
there's a few takeaways. Product managers always provide clarity. Go to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. Understand where your users are going, where the market is going, what customers want, what makes sense for your business. And don't just build for the problems of now, but foresee the problems of the future and try to build for that. And also do whatever it takes. So as a PM, you, I think a PMs need to have probably the least ego in any company because sometimes you're you know, doing cool things like going to launch events, or giving big presentations in front of senior leadership. And sometimes you're literally sifting through hundreds of bugs or hundreds of emails and you know, just really doing project management things or filling out spreadsheets to understand all the feedback that's happening. You're going deep into um, sometimes even the code itself and understanding what's going wrong. Uh, and so I think if you're if, to be a good PM, you need to let go of your ego and we just do anything that you need to do to make sure that your product gets out the door. Another way to think about this is like if there's like many different roles that are required to launch a product, the PM is kind of like fills in the space of whatever is needed. So if you have less UX re resources than you need, then PM provides more UX help. If you have less marketing, then PM provides marketing help. And so you kind of have to become a jack of all trades. And you as a PM are the biggest advocate for your product uh, across Google and also outside. So other people on the team will not speak for your product, but you need to speak for it so that you can get more resources, so that engineers can do cooler things. Um, and also because uh, everyone is working really hard, especially at Google, especially the engineers, and so you need to make sure that their work is recognized. And like I mentioned earlier, you need to remain humble because you're kind of like uh, the service provider who's trying to make sure that everything is getting out the door, but often you're in the background as well. And also as a PM, the, one of the biggest uh, lessons that I learned is that like, like I mentioned earlier about being in the background is that if you help others succeed, if you make an engineer's life easier or a UX person's life easier or a BD person's life easier, that's what makes you feel good and that makes that really helps you buck up your team. And also what, what, that's also what makes people really like you and want to work with you and want to trust you to make decisions for their product because you're in it to help push up others, not yourself. And so on that same note, you know, give lots of credit. You're kind of the person in the behind the scenes project managing and making sure that things are getting done. But the actual tangible work is all being done by other people. And so make sure that they're getting the credit that they deserve. And also, again, you have to really feel ownership over what you're doing. And so if you find a bug, make sure that it gets fixed. Um, if you find some issue or some you know, user complaint, Make sure that it's dealt with. No one else is going to remember all of these details that fall on the PM. And so really, really, you have to care about the details. And through all of this, you have to remain optimistic. Any launch or any project uh, that you work on will have delays, will have unforeseen issues, will have resourcing issues. Um, maybe a global pandemic will hit. But you need to remain optimistic that, hey, we're going to launch this thing. It's going to be awesome. People are going to love it. All your hard work will pay off. You know, Motivate the team. Keep them excited. The amount of times that I just organized like, appreciation uh, time for engineers or making sure that everyone gets t-shirts or everyone gets cookies or you know, just appreciate people uh, and you know, remind people why they're doing the job that they're doing. Because yes, we're doing it because we need a job, but we're also doing it because we want to have a great impact and make our users happy. And that's like a really great uh, place to be. So in summary, um, PMs and a, a great PMs are domain product and user experts really love and understand technology. Uh, most of the best PMs I know are like technology nerds and are obsessed, and are obsessed with it, um, are really good at communicating and also thinking about all the details of the product. And also have really mastered the PM basics, like roadmaps, PRDs, one pages, the planning processes, slides that I mentioned. And really good PMs land the product, not just launch the product, and balance what's good for businesses and for users. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Hania. That was really insightful. Uh, we have a bunch of questions which we'll start taking now. Uh, so to start with, there are a lot of questions from aspiring PMs. Uh, PMs, uh, people who get into product, want to get into product management from an engineering background, non-engineering background, and uh, just want to understand what are the skills required to get in PM. So you mentioned that uh, you need good project management skills, you need good communication skills, you need uh, to have a grip around data. So if you could just uh, give a quick insight into the aspiring PMs and what all should they be looking at? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, aspiring PMs, I think the one thing that I mentioned in my talk and is really valued at Google uh, is having technical skills or being technical in some way. So a computer science degree or for people who are already finished with university, maybe a certificate. So learning how to code and building side projects. So then learning how to code. And the second thing is the, the side projects or, or any kind of entrepreneurial effort. So PMs are self-starters. You have no one asking you that, hey, are you finishing your work? Hey, like, have you finished these tasks? Tasks, PMs have to create their own tasks, create the to-dos, make sure everyone else is doing what they're doing and also do it themselves. So a good a way to get into it is, you know, run your own side project or once you learn coding or even like, it doesn't even have to be coding related. Uh, and, and then run it yourself, get something done, show that, hey, I achieved this or I launched this or I landed this. And also if, if you can do it with other people, that's even better. Um, so at Google, we encourage this idea of 20% projects for people. And so I think uh, those two things, coding and doing entrepreneurial type things are maybe most important. And a lot of the other stuff you can pick up on the job of project management. Uh, if you can do data analysis or show that you can understand data, that's also a plus. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, the next question was, uh, how do you identify user needs when there's not enough data or if the data is skewed? So how do you balance between data and intuition? And how do you go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, so often, especially before you launch a project, a, a product, you don't have uh, the data on it. But you can find proxies to that data. So you can do a bunch of research online. So for example, when we were launching our payments app for Singapore, we just did a, a market analysis of understanding what are the other payments like or fintech apps that people are using, what are the features that people like in Singapore. Um, and then also just go out and talk to people. Like if your user is everyone, then you can go and talk to someone on the street and say, hey, wouldn't you want an app that does this? And obviously ask the question not in a leading way like that. But you know, understand what are the pain points that people are having. And you might find that something that you thought, so an app that you thought was super useful, you talk to 10 people and no one actually, people say, oh, I guess maybe, or or, or they say like, oh, yeah, I think I would like that, but you know, they've never thought about it before. If they've never thought about that pain point before, then it's probably not a big pain point to them. So I would say like definitely just go and talk to your target audience. Um, there's nothing that replaces actually being on the ground um, and talking to people. Okay. Uh, the next question by Anirudh says, uh, have a question on post-launch of a product. So what all activities uh, PMs at Google are involved in post the launch? They mentioned shipping versus landing. So once, how do you, uh, once the product shipped, what all activities are you involved in? Yeah, so the first thing is just watching the data roll in and understanding how people are using the app. So for example, how many people launch uh, like go, get to the, the Play Store app store listing, how many people download the app, how many people sign up, and then when they sign up, what, it, what do they actually do on the app? So a lot of it is just sifting through the data and understanding. And obviously, invariably, we're going to have bugs and issues during launch time. So, you know, figuring out the bug, understanding what's wrong, figuring out, pulling in the right engineers to make sure that those bugs are being fixed. And also prioritizing the bugs, because we're probably going to have like 20 bugs at launch time, and which are most uh, important or launch blocking. Um, and so doing that prioritization uh, in some document. And also keeping a track on the feedback that's coming in, because the feedback could be coming in through press and media, but it could also be coming in on where people are dropping off on the app or in Play Store app reviews or even from friends and family. So once like you've launched an app, make sure your friends and family are using it and you're getting feedback directly from them. OK, OK. Uh, the next question is, uh, when pitching an idea to senior management, uh, there is uh, the idea doesn't always get picked up. So 
do you have any advice on how to go about that uh, if it's a one pager that you're creating or how to effectively communicate your idea in senior management yeah um i think so senior managers are people just like you and me so and they have their own priorities so i think the biggest thing is to understand the priorities of those people so you as a pm your priority is the user and what the user wants but senior managers might have other priorities so if you can pitch your idea in a way that it's a win win it's a win for the users but also a win for the senior managers priority let's say the senior managers priority is you know uh to have like a good brand image or to you know generate more users or get more money or um you know they could have any number of priorities once you understand what it is you could say hey my feature uh will bring in this much amount of revenue and will solve this pain point for the end user so you kind of tailor your pitch in a way that you think they will receive it more uh, receive it better and also just make it simple and concise like if they need to be able to have like uh three sentences that they take away from that meeting so if often when we as pms were deep in the weeds and were deep in the details we sometimes um even when we're telling other people we tell them way too many details so make sure you distill out and it, this is good if you practice with someone who doesn't know your product at all uh like a friend or someone uh and you know help make them help you pick out what is actually the necessary information that you need to convey and what is not necessary and so and then also when you make that presentation i'm really bad at this i want to get better but often i kind of just like write blocks of text because that's just how i think um but people understand way better if it's visual so the more diagrams you can make like in this presentation i made the waterfall and the agile diagram uh so the more diagrams or visuals that you can make the more you can make it fun and appealing the less text and the more visuals the better all right okay we have a bunch of engineers also attending the talk and we received a couple questions this is a tricky one it says as an engineer what can they do to make a pms like easier so any <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question um I think <laughs> I think definitely just communicate uh so I I think with PMs and engineers like often engineers are um like I think the cl classic interaction that happens is an engineer says or a PM is like how long will this take and an engineer says oh it's complicated in all of these ways and the PM is like okay just tell me how long it will take and the engineer is like i don't know it's just like a ballpark maybe 2 weeks um but I think PMs can as so engineers can just help by communicating so Uh, and i think that's why we have uh, stand ups for example by saying like okay like once you take on a project you know how is it going is it going well do you think it might finish earlier than you expect or do you think are you seeing some issues that might that are coming up or are you seeing some issues that might come up they're not an issue yet but they could become an issue so i think the more that engineers communicate with pms uh, and also or like you know let's say they've taken something on but it's you know it's actually was way more complicated than they anticipated you know share all of that with the pm so that we can help you and help you know lessen your load if needed or if you if give you they are give you more work if needed and also um i think engineers are often some of the best dog fooders or you know users of the product so use the product give feedback uh, be direct be blunt um and you know especially if you think the product is going in a direction that's not honoring the user um engineers should be okay to call that out uh with their pm that's a great answer anya yeah. thank you uh another question around uh so says does a pm need to be proficient in sql or any programming languages what tech stacks should they be aware of or tools like figma which you mentioned so uh any such tools which you recommend for them to pick up Yeah so I think for UX uh just at Google we use Sketch before and then Figma and that all I picked up once I started working at at Google I think in terms of uh so SQL uh we I I learned that when I was on the data analysis team and it did help me in other teams but it wasn't always necessary uh I think definitely knowing coding will help if you want to start coding Python is probably the best place to start and then um yeah understanding uh, so if you're working on an android app understanding java and android developer studio if you're working on an ios app understanding um objective objective c 
Um, and then also for web development, whatever is popular these days, I've actually not worked on web development. So I think you know, basically whatever uh, project you're working on, understanding the technology behind there. So especially if you're interviewing for like a website, you know, understand what technology they're using and make sure you're preparing based on that. And then a lot of the time, I was lucky enough that when after I joined the team, I, then I picked up on the technologies that the team was using, and I kind of learned on the job. Uh, so you know, give yourself room to do that as well. Got it. Okay. Uh, there's a question on one page, uh, honey. It says, uh, "Is it more of an executive summary of a new idea, business plan? So what all does it need to answer the why's and how's and how to go about that?" Yeah. So, yeah. I think so. The one pager basically has to have the main idea, like the main core of what you're doing, without all of the extra details of like, oh, in this edge case or in case that. So basically, the main. So it, I'm sure there's many use cases, but the main user journey, like the everything goes well user journey, should be covered in the one pager. Um, it, so it could be an executive summary. That's a, another way to say. It, but it's, it, but it has. It does have to have the details of the product. It can't just be like. It, the details of the user journey of the product, not just like a, you know, high level, visually fluffy like this is what the project will do. It has to show what the user will do. Got it. Okay. Uh, the next question: uh, Could you share some advice about product prioritization methods and any techniques that you recommend? Yeah, that's always tough. Um, and I think it's also tough because people have many different opinions because, you know, let's say if you have 10 features, people think this feature is more important, that, spe that feature is more important. And so data is your friend. Data is on your side. Uh, in that case, if you have 10 features, then try to work with business development or um, UX and try to understand the impact of each feature. So, like, basically, let's say if a feature is trying to address a pain point, understand how many users have that pain point or how often has it come up or try to do surveys with your users. So if you have enough users, Google has this thing called Hats, which does in-app surveys. Um, and, to, and basically try to understand, like, if you think that this out of these 10 features, this one feature is because of this one pain point, and do a survey, and then only 20% of people agree that it's a pain point, then that's data that you have. Um, and you can say, well, I think 20% of all of our users have this pain point, so this will help them. So how, how many users will it help? Uh, and also, how much potential revenue will it bring in? And so if you have those numbers, then you can prioritize across the features. And then it's, it's, it doesn't become a, oh, but I like this, and or you like that. It becomes a, well, the data says that we will get more users because of this. Or the data says that more people, like we will convert more people in our funnel if we launch this feature. So let's make it a priority. Got it. OK. Okay, uh, this one question is asked, do you have a Scrum Master allocated? Is your team dedicated, or do you switch to different UX tech teams from one phase to the other phase of the product? Uh, so it's different on different teams at Google. In general, sometimes, so the more organized or bigger teams that I've been on, they do have a Scrum Master. Uh, and that Scrum mas Master is, is usually our technical project manager or, uh, or project manager. Um, and in some teams, like so, so smaller teams where there was no project manager, the PM, the product manager, was the scrum master. Um, and so, uh, so, so that's the answer on that. And what was the second part of the question? Um, so, second part was yeah, that. Uh, so yeah, we have different. Uh, we have different teams from one phase to the yeah, other. Different. Yeah. Yeah. So um, often, so often, no. Often the teams are very uh, variable. So especially in a large team like Google Pay had like more than 150 engineers. And so on some projects, I was working with two, three engineers in that one UX, and another project I was working with these five engineers. So our teams at Google are are always changing, and so it's exciting in some ways because you always get to work with new people. And if a team gets big enough or you get senior enough, then you get a dedicated team assigned to you that you always work with. Um, but in general, they're, they're moving around a lot. Got it. OK. Uh, there are a bunch of questions around reading recommendations or any videos, any resources which you recommend around product management. Yeah. 
Okay, I don't have like a good answer for this. So if you're interviewing, cracking the PM interview was what got me through all my interviews and obviously cracking the coding interview as well. Um, but in general, I don't follow that many blogs or uh, Twitter accounts, okay. so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's okay because there were questions around how do we crack Google and how do, I mean, any interview tips or how does the interview process at Google look like? So, yeah, yeah, those two books are the best. Uh, uh, and definitely for PM interviews, there are there is a technical interview uh, at Google, which is uh, probably the hardest because um, a lot of PMs are not technical. So definitely spend some time uh, on the technical aspect. And it's data structures and algorithms. Got it. OK. Uh, another question on PRD. It says, please tell more about what you do if your first draft of PRD gets trimmed down due to timeline constraints? Um, great question. So I think, so let's say like if your first draft gets trimmed down, then make sure you, and I often like writing phases in my PRD. So like this is the vision, the user, the use cases, and then this is the MVP, and that has the MVP scope. And then this is next phase one, phase two, etc. And so if your PRD gets trimmed down, don't just delete uh, stuff, but make sure it's moved on to phase one or phase two. Uh, or like the next few phases of of the launch because of uh, and to un, until and you need to keep working and pushing this project until it gets to a state where you're happy with it when it's landed, um, because obviously trim downs will happen and there's limited resources and so that's just the reality of working in this uh, tech space. But you need to keep pushing for resources until you think you have a product that you're you're proud to tell your mom about. Yeah. Okay. Another great question, Hania. How do we own failures as a PM? I'm constantly anxious about how feature launches will pan out. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's a good question, and that's that's a tough one because uh, often as a PM you feel very responsible because you're making a lot of decisions, um, and you and you know like you're because you have the full 360 perspective uh, from cross-functional and from leadership, etc. Uh, you have to make tough decisions, um, and. What, so basically what you can do is, and what I like to do is try to document it, like if you're making a decision saying like, based on all of this data, we made this decision to like, let's say delay the launch, or we made this decision that even though there was uh, some issue or these bugs, we decided to go forward with the launch. But if you try to document why you made that decision, uh, then later on, let's say two days later, or two weeks later, or two months later, if some of those assumptions t change, or be because you have new data that you didn't have before, then you can always go back and say, well, I made two months ago I made this decision because of this data, but now that that has changed, so now I'm making this. And then it it's it makes you feel better because you know that you made the best decision with the data that you had, and it makes the team uh, like trust you and rely on you more because they know why you made that decision. It's not like you made it as a secret, um, and so. And yeah, so I think I think that that really helps me. And also try to get as much data as you can. And that's obviously the user data and usage of the app data, but also data as in uh, like you know what are leadership's priorities. So often features get cut because leadership, um, you know, there might be issues coming up or there might be a resource constraint. And so it's also on you to have your thumb on the pulse of understanding what's going on with leadership. You know. Are we like? Are we not hiring new engineers? If so, should we even start working on this project if we think it won't be able to finish? So you need to keep all of those things in mind so that you protect your engineers' time. Okay. Okay. We'll just take one last question. Uh, this question is around metrics. So how do you define metrics? Success, failure, not star metrics. How do you go about defining those? Do you benchmark those against uh, something? How? Yeah. yeah, so I think um, often usage, so I, I, us I like to start with usage. So for example, for an app, for example, you have the number of people who have installed your ha app, but then you have the number of people who are using it monthly, and then the number of people who are using it daily. Uh, yeah. And also, it, it depends on your app. If you can also look at weekly. So, so, so some apps are not meant to be used daily, so maybe looking at dailies is not a good metric for you. But often, so what you should do is like look at user journey. So what do you want people to be doing on the app? Or in, in an ideal scenario, what would a user be doing? And then understand those funnels, and then use those funnels to build metrics. So you know how many, let's say like 
people opening the app, signing up, doing the first thing, doing the second thing, sending a profile picture, et cetera. Those are all milestones. And if you can know how many people are doing which milestone, you can see where people are dropping off. Uh, so that's for success. And for failure, it's kind of like, well, if people are not doing this or if people are using the app in a completely different way, that might not even be a failure, but a reason to pivot. So let's say if you launch an app with 10 features and you think feature number one or two are the main features, but most people are using your app for feature number seven, then maybe you need to pivot and focus on feature number seven um, instead of focusing on feature number one and two. Right. OK. OK. Uh, I think our time's also up with this, Hania. Thank you so yeah. much once again for taking out the time. Yeah. Uh, for everyone who asked for a recording, we will be sharing the recording. I'll share the link to the Meetup group again. Please join the group, and we'll share the link to the recording as soon as it's up. And yeah, thanks again, Hania. This was really insightful. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, I know we ran out of time here. I will share your LinkedIn profile in the chat as well. No worries. Thank you.